This is Dan Santat, and you're listening to the Great Big Beautiful Podcast. there's a danger if you become too much of a public figure as a writer and you become too enamored of your work and too enamored of your own importance and uh, oh look at me aren't I wonderful then I think you risk becoming not a very good author yeah. because it's easier just to go out there and be worshipped than just to sit down and do the hard work and that's after all why people came to you in the first place so do the work here are your hosts Jamie Green and Justin Connors Podcasting is a art form that requires many moving pieces and schedules getting together, and we we're here finally to do this. Uh, we're Jamie, me, and Jamie to talk, and we decided a few things about the direction of the show, and one of them is to kick me off of it. It's basically, yeah, right, it's it's been real, Justin. <laughs> but you know what? We can't have you holding this back anymore. No. Oh. <laughs> oh, there goes my mic. And oh, what is that? See, laugh? Is that dropping our new, the mic all the time. Is that our new host already? Did I hear our new host laughing? I heard a giggle. I heard a giggle. <laughs> I heard a giggle. So, Jamie, a maybe giggle? you can explain a little better what what it is we're doing and how how it's going to work and what it means. So, Justin and I have been doing this for what two years? We're in our second year, I yes. think, right? Yes, we are. Yeah, and so we're past 120 episodes, and we're having a blast. We're having a good time. Um, we've been, you know, built up our audience, but one thing that I've been hearing is that they hate Justin. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Um, it, I, I've heard it from a few people and I've, it's also been in the back of my mind that, um, I'd like to get a little bit, um, more of a, uh, more different perspectives, I guess, mm-hmm. um, you know, Justin and I can only go so far beyond our own experiences and who we are. Um, and so this is it's not going to be every episode, but occasionally, depending on who the guest will be, uh, we're going to bring in um, another co-host to give that additional perspective. Right. Um, you know, as much as Justin and I can sit here and totally BS, um, you know, we're not women. <laughs> we're not people of color. We don't have um that point of view and perspective that could be really valuable with the appropriate guest um and so this being the beginning of 2017 we thought it would be a great time to start um with that again it's not going to be every episode this is you know we joke i'm justin's not going anywhere (laughs) i'm not going anywhere um it's you know we're still going to be the two main hosts but i wanted to just sort of bring in that additional voice that neither one of us could provide if that makes sense that makes complete sense to me and and it it will be great because there's a lot of the times where you know jamie knows a lot more about publishers and books and authors and who's all in that that's that's his day job too that's what he's in he's that's what he's into (laughs) so when there's somebody that comes up oftentimes and it's not, it's not, I don't think it's because I'm dumb or anything, but he's like, do you even know yeah. who this is? And I'm just like, uh, yes, of course I do. <laughs> While you're typing in Google. <laughs> exactly. And so it's really great when we can bring in someone like this week's guest host, Samantha Fisher, who is a big fan of the authors that we are about to uh, interview. And I think it really works out. And you're probably going to be able to tell within the interview that, that she is probably more fluent in in this person's work, these people's work, than I am. So I think it's great. It's going to be fun. Sam, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Samantha Fisher, and I um, I write for Geek Mom blog. So uh, that's how I actually got to know 
these two fine gentlemen here. Don't lie. We're not uh, lying. <laughs> <laughs> all right. These pseudo okay, non gentle men. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's how I got involved in all of this. And um, I actually was a, a panel guest for you guys yes. a while back. I don't know if you remember that. Of course. Um, th- that was a busy call. I remember that one. There were a lot, there were of, a lot people of people on, on that call. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. It was chaotic, but fun. Uh, so I kind of got bit by the bug, so to speak. Um, I really like the way that this particular podcast is run. So um, I went when I heard the announcement about Terry Brooks wrapping up the Shannara series, um, I immediately went to Jamie and said, do you think you could get an interview? And if you can, can I be on it? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I'm here today, because uh, I totally flipped out when I heard about the change to the Shannara series and I appealed to Jamie's good graces to hook me up fat. Yeah. This, uh, this was probably the fastest I ever got it. Um, went from somebody <laughs> and, and I'll be honest. Um, I, obviously I know who Terry Brooks is. I've read, I've read some of his books, but he wasn't, he wasn't near the top of the list of people I had been contacting Obviously, we're 120 episodes in. Um, but uh, w- once Sam said, hey, you think we could get Terry Brooks? Because he just had this big announcement. And I went and I read about the announcement. And I said, absolutely. And so I reached out. And like within a couple of days, I got a, you know, a, um, a yes back from the publicist. And we had mm-hmm. it all set up. And at that point, I was like, well, I can't really just dump Sam. It was her <laughs> idea. <laughs> so I said, this is a great place. You know, Sam, I don't know. So Thanks this, for the idea. but I said, this is a perfect place to start with the yeah. whole idea of bringing, bringing in somebody else, bringing in our, that fresh voice. So, mm-hmm. um, Sam, you are obviously a, a huge fan. It comes through in, when we talk to him. Um, you kind of go into it a little bit when we're talking to him, but... Um, I was wondering if maybe you could just quickly sort of give us a, you know, a history of your fandom in Chanera and with Terry Brooks in general. Yeah, so I, I allude to it a little bit. I didn't want to waste that wonderful man's time with the whole story, but um, I grew up and still live in a very rural part of Ohio. Um, so farming community, that sort of thing. There was no such thing as cable TV. The internet was just happening, but who owned a computer kind of thing, right? When I was a a young teenager, Um, it was very boring out there. So I did a lot of reading. That was my pastime uh, because if the television was on, it was on one of the three channels that we were able to get. And that was pretty much determined by my parents, of course. And uh, I definitely dove into books, but I was very limited. Um, We didn't have a lot of money for books. Again, rural America not the richest people in the world. So I remember being with my father at a yard sale. We did a lot of that on the weekends. And I looked over at this one particular yard sale and I saw a fairly large box of books that said entire box $3. And I didn't care what was in that box. There were books and I hadn't read them and I was excited. And so those aren't the ones that are in my library, right? With a few books I had at home, which were almost all Westerns. Just gonna put that out there. And uh, so I grabbed the box and I bought it for $3. I took it home that evening and was sorting through it. And, you know, I had no intention of keeping them all. I was going to pass them off to my father. We resold things at flea markets Mm -hmm. to make extra money. It was one of the things we did. So I was sorting through it to determine which ones I wanted to read, which ones I didn't want. And Elfstones of Shannara was in that box. And it was the only book in there of the fantasy sci-fi kind of book there were a whole bunch of other types of books it's the only one i remember though Uh and i remember it distinctly that cover is burned in my brain because i'm like oh i'll start reading this one tonight it looks kind of interesting i've never read anything like this and i read the entire book in the next two days i didn't sleep for two nights i just tore through that book um you know and in the grand scheme of things it's not the best fantasy sci-fi depends on your perspective since it's set in the past kind of book ever written. And it's not even the best by Terry Brooks, but it was something I'd never experienced before. It and opened that door for you. Yeah. From that point onward. I mean, it's, I've been, I, he and his book introduced me to being a geek. I mean, it really did. It was that first step for me. Um, 
Had, and had you read any fantasy or sci-fi before that book, or was that the first book of the entire the genre that you first. ever read? Wow. Very first. I'd never. I, it was very limited into what I had at my disposal. And in fact, I remember my dad joking. Uh, he was just joking, but he did call it that devil worshippers book with a <laughs> ha 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 because he had never seen anything like it either, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, I read it. Read some of the other books in the box too. Um, but that was the one I kept. The rest, I was like, yeah, I've read them. You can get rid of them. But that one, I kept. I kept until it sadly burned in a fire when I was oh. nineteen. So I'm I'm curious, you know, as somebody who has never, you know, that was the the first fantasy book you had ever read, but it was part of this much larger world, much longer series. Did it did it bother you that it wasn't the first book? Like, w- were there a lot of references and allusions that you were like, what? Who's that person? What what are they talking about? No, he did a good job, like like a lot of authors who do multiple book series do, uh, of kind of bringing you up to speed, like. Mm-hmm. When a character was introduced, you kind of got that quick backstory on who they were. So I had no trouble understanding it. And I'm very much glad I did read that first and not Sword of Shannara. Because I went back and read Sword of Shannara. And like most people say, it's not the best. (laughs) It introduced the world. But had I read that one first, I may not have kept going, to be honest. But they got better and better. And, you know, by the time we hit Wish Song, which was the third one in that original trilogy... Oh man, was I hooked! That was a fine story and and well written and uh, really good. So, yeah. yeah, it it was. If I'd read the other one first, I probably wouldn't have kept going. So I'm glad this was the one I found. I'm glad I went back and read the first one, but mm-hmm. not my favorite. Well, what's fascinating to me is that not only is the Shannara Chronicles like the Shannara series long. But it's incredibly long. Like there's something like 30 books in the series now. Um, yeah. Not even not to mention short mm-hmm. stories that have appeared in other compilations and uh, things he's written online that tie into the universe. Um, so it's it's one of those series that it's kind of daunting to to look at from an outsider if you've never read any of the books because you're like, oh, do I really need to read 30 books? <laughs> you know, yes. the answer is um, yes. The answer is yes. You know, I mean, you look at Tolkien. And you're like, okay, you know, The Hobbit and in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, I could probably stop there. I don't need to read all of those other books that he wrote that are just like sort of backstory and mythology. Um, you know, but then there's like, there are, seri- there are certain series that are just a little overwhelming to me. You know, it's Shannara, you know, The Wheel of Time. You look at those books and it's like, again, what are they? There's only like 10 or 11 of those books, but they're each like 1,500 pages long. So it's like... They get bigger. Each one's They get longer. bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> And I think I've read like the first two or three of those. And I was like, I can't do it anymore. It's too many words. <laughs> um, I, get, I, get, I get stressed out about reading all of the Berenstein Bears, let alone those. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I was at the library yesterday with my kids and I saw a whole table full of Berenstein Bears books that I'd never even seen before. <laughs> um, but so the, 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 the announcement that we alluded to at the top of the show is that um, he recently said the next tr- the trilogy of books that he's working on now, so the, the next three books that are going to come out, will end the story chronologically. So these will be the final three books in the timeline series of Shannara. It's going to wrap up the story. It's going to end the, everybody's story in the way that he wants to. Um, he's not done with writing. He's not even done with writing in the Shannara world. It's he'll just go back and fill in some holes, talk about prehistory. Um, but in, in in the larger timeline, the story as it's been told over how many books, this final trilogy is going to to end the series. Um, so it's caused a lot of teeth gnashing and wailing you know sam was one of those people who was crying no! of clothes, tearing of hair yeah <laughs> exactly exactly um so we had him on we we'll talk um primarily about the shannara books and uh you know sort of his his journey and um where he came from we talk a little bit about the show <clears throat> because if you um if 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 you've never read the books but you're like shannara 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 you know so it sounds familiar there is the uh, the Shannara Chronicle show. It's on MTV. Um, it's the first series. The first season has aired, correct? Yes, they're they're filming season two right now. 
All right, they're filming season two right now. I remember last year at New York Comic Con, there was a three story tall poster for the Shannara Chronicles. Wow. Um, so they were, it was, it got a big push. MTV put a lot of money behind it. Um, so we talk about the show a little bit, we talk about the books a lot. Um, and if you are a Star Wars fan, his name might be familiar because he wrote the novelization for The Phantom Menace. Um, and it's, it's very funny if you go to his website. Um, I think the like his one sentence description of himself is it's something like author of of the Shannara Chronicles, or thirty books in the Shannara Chronicles, and the Phantom Menace. You know, like <laughs> he he still owns up to it, but it's sort of like as that afterthought of everything else that he's done. Um, but he has played in that universe, so we did talk to him a little bit at the very end <laughs> about um, Princess Leia and Carrie Fisher's passing and what his thoughts on whether she the character should be recast or she should be written out of the out of the saga um i'm not going to tell you what he says you have to listen to it um but it's a it's a really good conversation and sam i think you did a fantastic job welcome to the team oh thank you i appreciate the the chance (laughs) we're gonna go play that interview for you right now hope you enjoy terry thank you so much for taking the time to chat it's an absolute pleasure to have you here I wanted to start with uh, the relatively recent announcement that the books you're working on now, so the upcoming trilogy, will be the last chron- chronologically in the Shannara series. Um, I guess what I want to know is what made you realize that it, w- it was time for you to wrap up that story? Well, I've, I've told this same story uh, probably about two dozen times, yeah. but it has to do with the dawning realization that my plan to live forever may not work out. Um, it appears nobody's done that yet. So I thought, well, I better have a backup plan. Uh, because if I should expire unexpectedly, leaving it unfinished, we all know what will happen. El Ray really will run out and hire somebody to finish it for me, which would probably bring me back to life pretty fast as one of the walking <laughs> dead. Um, and I don't want anybody finishing this because I know what the ending is, and I've had this ending in mind since almost since the time I started the story. So uh, I felt a certain you know impetus here to go ahead and and do it now. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I'm still cogent, you know, and functioning, uh, <laughs> but also because uh, I don't want any unexpected uh, events to uh, cut my plan short. It's interesting because we were going to ask you this a little bit later, but um, obviously you have the ending that you have in mind and you you want to be the one to write it, obviously. But I mean, what are your thoughts about somebody else coming in after the fact and maybe filling in some holes or telling a prehistory story or somebody else coming in to play in your sandbox as long as it's not part of the primary chronology that you're telling? Well, if I'm dead, I don't care. <laughs> But until that point, the answer is a no. At that point, um, and my children, I'm sure, would be love, love, love to have that that happen, so that they could continue the series and live in the style to which they've grown accustomed. <laughs> I think, I think it's just, um, you know, I'm, I'm a very anal type of guy, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, I, my report cards uh, when I was growing up all said does not play well with others. Well, not much has changed, and so. I really am possessive about this series, and uh, I've had offers before to have uh, people write with me and work with me, and I just thought, well, they could do that, but what I would be doing is adding their name to something I did and that they never got their hands on. (laughs) So it didn't make much sense. I just feel like, uh, you know, if you have to recognize what your strengths and weaknesses are in this writing game, and and for me, uh, I work better when I'm working alone. Not to say... I don't take editorial direction because I do. Right. (laughs) It's just that the original creation, I really need to do that. And then after that, I'm happy to take whatever uh, Ann Grohl has to say and work with it. Okay. Well, I did read on your website that you're planning to continue writing about Shannara, just not extend the timeline. So you're going to be kind of plugging in some of the holes, maybe telling some stories about characters we already know. Is that what the plan is? Well, I don't know what the plan is anymore. You know, the plan varies uh, from year to year, it seems like. Um, I I think that uh, for a long time I wrote uh, because people wanted me to continue writing these stories because I was having a good time with them. uh, But all the while I was looking for that end point. Um, And I just decided a couple years ago, you know, you need to do it now. 
Um, but you don't have to give up writing the whole thing. I'm not sure everybody got that part because there's been a lot of thrashing and moaning about it, about not writing anymore. And well, I'm not saying I'm not going to write anymore. What I want is the freedom to write whatever I feel like writing. And I have not had that for a very long, well, I've not had it in the way I would like to have it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always write under contract. I always write in groups. I'm thinking, you know, what I really want to do now is to uh, wrap this, this series up to a point where I'm happy with it. And then if I feel like going back and mm -hmm. adding some things or if I go back and do what I promised to do for, you know, 15 years, which is to finish the prehistory, um, I can go back and do it. Um, but I don't have to, you know, I can leave that alone if I just, you know, if I want to go on and write some other things. So of those other things that you might want to write about, um, this one uh, was actually asked of another geek dad, um, Rob Huddleston, which um, he's actually met you a few times at a few events. Um, but he wanted to know, do you have any plans to return to the world of Landover? Well, I have been saying it for a while now that if they make the movie, I would return in a nanosecond. <laughs> but uh, the movie has been kicked around pretty good out there at La La Land. And um, I don't know if it'll get made. Uh, I just can't tell. Uh, every time we think it's on the verge of happening, um, a studio head intervenes and says, no, I don't think so. Or he gets fired and we lose our champion or whatever. It just goes on and on. <laughs> but um, I think at some point I will go back and write at least one more Landover story. But I'm not as compelled to do that as I am some other things. So um, that one's on kind of an indefinite hold at this point. Okay. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you say, and we've been saying so far here, Shannara, and most fans <laughs> say Shannara. Um, does that ever get, and I've, I've heard you say you gave up long ago trying to correct people. Um, <laughs> but does that get frustrating to you? I mean, do you ever sit down and be like, man, I wish I thought of a different name? <laughs> well, like, it, it probably would have saved me a lot of explanation. <laughs> If I'd done that, but I always felt like um, I didn't want to be the guy who did appendices and glossaries and that sort of thing. Um, I write straightforward adventure stories. You come in, you, you read it, you can't put it down, and you get out of it. You move on with your life. Um, and I feel like part of what makes stories successful is that the uh, readers take ownership of yeah. the material. Um, and part of that is the pronunciation of the names. So if I go around like a school teacher correcting them about everything, then I feel like I'm cutting back on their experience. It's like spending too much time describing characters, too much time, you know, covering everything. And, and it's a, it's a, a, it's the experience is better if the reader meets you halfway. The reader has to put something into it in the imagination part, particularly in fantasy. So um, I have not bothered with correcting it. And of course, this has caused me undue difficulty because <laughs> they, I thought, you know, I was raised, <laughs> I was raised back when uh, on phonics. Now in phonics, it's really easy to figure because if you have double letters, yep. you split them in discussion. So it's Shan, Na, Ra. Yep. How can you not know this? <laughs> oh, no. Shamara to practically everybody. And I found this out some years ago. Um, that they just, they didn't, they all said Shannara. And I thought, well, geez, if they all say it that way, it's a democracy, so fine. <laughs> just say it that way. And the movie people, the TV people, same thing. You know, they announced early on, they, they were doing the Sh Shannara Chronicles. And they said, well, that's great, but there's one thing, that's not how you say it. <laughs> and they said, is it? And I said, no. And they said, well, all your fans say it that way, don't they? And I said, yeah, but, and they said, well, that's good enough for us. <laughs> well, that was that. <laughs> well, speaking of that, how did you come up with that name? I, I mean, was there, did it just come to you as a, a play on words for something? Like, where did that come from? It's very unique. Yeah, it was a long time ago in 1968, and I have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Good yeah, answer. Too much red no, wine. <laughs> just, came up, just came up because I was fiddling around with, you know, syllables and names that seemed interesting and... Um, I kind of work in a haphazard fashion that way anyway. I'm always taking names off of signs and streaks and stores and all of these things and writing them down, you know, and then later I'll play around with my list of names to come up with what I'm looking for. Um, and it works much easier than if you sit down and say, well, I need 50 new names for this story. <laughs> Blank. Uh, so I don't do that. And um, a lot of my names, I can tell you where they came from. Um, a lot of them, no clue. I can tell you, for example, that 
Mantrog, which is a character, which is a creature in Running with the Demon, is a village in Wales. And I'm sure, you know, they don't appreciate what I've done to them. <laughs> oh, but Wales, Wales is like a gold mine for crazy words. Oh, it's great. And I, I use Treffenwid from there. Um, and much of the mythology is Welsh. Uh, so in uh, the Running with it in the, uh, the Warden Void series, um, the title for the third book, Angel Fire East, I saw while riding through New England on the front of a star. And I thought, well, that's wasted. <laughs> <laughs> so I stole it. <laughs> um, I. I wanted to go back a bit. Um, I know you said it was, it's, it's been a while, but I know when you were first writing and pitching Sword of Shannara, it went through a lot of revisions and it was relatively a difficult road to get it published. Um, at any point in that process, before it was you know off print and you could hold it in your hands and say, wow, look what I've done, was there ever a point where you thought maybe you just made a mistake with this whole writing thing? Bite your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've always wanted to be a writer. Always. Yeah. Since I was 10 years old, when I was writing my first stories, and published at 13 in a little journal in Illinois, a uh, local journal, uh, writing a story about Lincoln, and got bit by the bug pretty seriously. It just took me another, you know, <laughs> it took another 20 years to get anywhere, but the, <laughs> the, uh, I never felt that way, no. Um, and really, the... The, the writing process was difficult because I rewrote the book three times before it ever got to Lester Delray. Yeah. And my getting published was easy. I have, this, I have the story that everybody wishes they had. Huh? Send it to one uh, publisher, Daw, Donald Wolheim. He looked at it and he said, what the? This is very <laughs> Tolkien-esque and it's 800 pages. I can't deal with this for a small you know, publishing company. So he said to me, he wrote back to me, finally said, I like this, and it's got some uh, real promise, but um, it's not for us. Why don't you send it over to uh, Ballantine Books? They have a new change in editorship over there. The Del Rey's had just come in. They were going to form their own imprint. So I sent it there, and, of course, uh, um, the rest history. of the story is yeah. pretty amazing, but I got picked up. It's just that Lester made me rewrite it, uh, yeah. pieces and parts, substantially, over two years. Uh, and uh, during that time, they went out and promoted it, hand sold it the way you did in those days, uh, to various bookstores and bookseller conventions, and you know said this was going to revolutionize the way that fantasy was viewed, and so on and so forth. And they were right; it 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 did, of course, because up to that point there wasn't a whole lot of fantasy, and everybody thought Tolkien was you know sacrosanct, and nobody could do anything that was Tolkien esque. Yeah. So. <laughs> was that intimidating to you as a you know as a young author and you know you finally got your first book accepted and you're going through revisions and they're out there selling it as like the greatest thing since sliced bread? They didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> they never told me anything. I mean, this was this is the days when I asked once about going on book tour, maybe doing a, a signing. Yeah. Buster said, "When you get a few more books written and you're a little more seasoned, then you can go out." And I said, "Yeah, but everybody else." Don't you worry about everybody else. Worry about yourself. You stay where you are. Write another book. You've only got one book right now. You don't need to be out. So they had a very, and you know, writers should be chained to their desk, write their stories. The stories should be, should be published, and the writer should never, never come between the book and the story. I mean, the book and, and the, uh, you know. So I thought later, he must be rolling over in his grave. Now. <laughs> Because, of oh, course, yeah. it's all about the author going out and marketing and publishing and having a website presence. And that's totally different. Yeah. All because of, you know, computers and, and social media and all of that. Yeah. That's, cra that's crazy because sometimes now publishers won't even sign an author unless they have that online presence to begin with. No, they, they definitely interview them with that thought in mind or look at them with that yeah. thought in mind, particularly for certain kinds of books. Um, and, you know, a lot of writers aren't like that, you know. Yeah, they They're write. Like, uh, they, they don't. Uh, they write because they like being alone, and exactly. they don't really want to interact with other people. Maybe they can't even interact with other people particularly well, and you have to learn to do that. But I came out of a culture where I had been interacting through debate in high school uh, and through law school and being a lawyer for a number of years, so that uh, for me it was a lot easier. Yeah. So. Uh, I'll kind of get back to the books themselves for a moment because um, I asked Jamie to help me pull this together. Um, I've been a fan of yours since I was a kid. Um, 
and it was Elf Stones was the very first fantasy slash sci-fi that I ever read. Um, I'll give you just a quick little bit of the story because there is one to how it came into my possession. Um, in my family, I was the youngest of five girls. Uh, we lived out literally in the middle of nowhere. I, I live in the same area now, again, still the middle of nowhere. I can't even get internet out there. It's, it's that closed down. Um, I was at a yard sale with my father and there was a box of books that said entire box, $3. And I loved to read. So I said, sold. I picked that box up and I took it home. And that original large paperback version of it was in there. And I'm like, oh, this looks cool. I picked it up and I read it. And I stayed up all night and I read it and I went to school the next day. And I came home and I read it and I finished it. I was in love with that book. Um, and that's when I found out and I went back after that red sword of Shannara. Um, but it's, this book will always have a place in my heart, but when I've read them all multiple times now, which is actually my favorite, um, I just connected better with the characters. I don't know if it was an age thing or what, um, it, it just the storyline, the singing, the power of singing, being magical said something to me. So that one has been my favorite of the books. Uh, but that made me wonder of those original three, do you have a favorite? And if you do, why? Shame on you. Oh, You're my asking sorry. me to choose between my children. You you can say no. <laughs> <laughs> I no, you know, I, I, there are things about them that uh, resonate with me after all these years because uh, they were important at the time I was working on the story, and I remember them all that way. I can tell you every year that everything was published, and I can tell you the difficulties with every single one. Uh, or the triumphs, or the things that I, that re, re, that I think are the best about those particular books, but I don't have a favorite between them. I really don't. I mean, I love them all. Um, I don't love them as much as you do, uh, <laughs> or any of the people who read books. Who I'm constantly amazed how much they are connected to the material, grateful and humbled by it, but also kind of surprised because you know I'm not the kind of guy who really attaches to. I will not walk across the street to stand in line for anything. I just won't, you know. And so the idea that people have this kind of connection um, is is pretty amazing. No, I don't know. I, I you know, um, the other thing I would say about wish about uh, Elfstones that Elfstones was a response to the fact that uh, the readers of Swords said there are no women in this story. So it was necessary for me to write a story with women, and I felt if I wanted to keep the readership, so they. You know, uh, I did. I wrote uh, Wish Song with two, uh, Elfstones with two strong characters. Then I wrote Wish Song, which is really my version of the Magnificent Seven. Hmm. I hadn't made that connection. <laughs> Interesting. You may, know that, you may notice practically everybody's dead at the end of that story. Yes. Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> I've read it by now. Well, I tell people the same thing. Don't ever get too attached to anybody in a Brooks book. <laughs> I will indiscriminately, well, not indiscriminately, but I will get rid of anybody if I feel it will advance the story and, uh, and, and serve the purposes of re advancing it in some way. You know, it's, what's interesting is what you just said, and it makes perfect sense, but I've never heard an author say it before. And, you know, through the show, I've talked to a lot of different authors of a lot of different genres. And, you know, when you just said, I like the books and I like the characters, but I don't love them as much as you do, you know, the fa i.e. the fans, it makes perfect sense because I can't even imagine if an author loved his or her own work more than anybody else. It would be, it, it's got to be, it's got to be sort of a self-defense mechanism to not fall in love with your own writing. How true. You know, I just feel like, uh, I, 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 you know, for one thing, I've read these books multiple times yeah. to the point where I can practically quote them. And, and so <clears throat> I have to get away for a while before I can come back and spend time with them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but uh, I, I think one of the problems we suffer because of this whole social media thing, and I'm kind of rabid about this, is that there's too much of us. Mm -hmm. Too much of us. You know, I don't like other authors that well. I don't need to see and learn everything about them. I don't want to read their damn blogs. I don't think it's necessary, but yet this is something that feeds into the public consciousness in a way that advances sales and does all this other stuff. 
Uh, I won't even tell you how I handle it, but you'd be appalled, I'm sure. Uh, I will say, though, that um, I, I feel like there's a danger if you become too much of a public figure as a writer and you become too enamored of your work and too enamored of your own importance and, uh, oh, look at me, aren't I wonderful? Then I think you risk becoming not a very good author yeah. because it's easier just to go out there and be worshipped than just to sit down and do the hard work. And that's, after all, why people came to you in the first place. So do the work. Do a book a year, you know, and, and which I've always done because I just feel like that's the mission I have. That's my marching orders. The publisher loves it that I do this. The fans <laughs> love it that I do this. I don't particularly feel like uh, any more public uh, appearances or, you know, attention is necessary for my life to be complete. I'm pretty happy right where I am, sitting here. Uh, so I, I just feel like for, for some authors it's a real pitfall and I've lost some, some friends of mine that are writers along the way because they've done too much of this sort of thing. Yeah. You know, but along those lines, to get a book out every year and to keep writing, you have to have, you know, you, not only do you have to have the love and the commitment, but I mean, there's a determination there and, and a I guess self-control. So, I mean... What is your writing regimen? Like, are you one of those guys who wakes up before the sun comes up and you just sit down and you write, or do you just write when you have an idea? Well, it's varied over the fifty some years I've been doing this. Yeah. Um, you know, because uh, I started out a single law student, gravitated through a couple marriages, children at some points, and then now I'm all that's behind me, and I'm back to being just me and my wife. And so my schedule is looser these days, and I write when I feel like it, but I know what it takes to get a book done, so I'm not too concerned about it. I don't fuss the way I used to. I can do twice as much in half the time yeah. because it's an experience thing, and you get experience by doing, and after a while, you, all the fears and so forth fall away for the most part, although like once in every book I decide I've written the world's worst story and I should ash can this thing right now and start over again. But I resist that urge, thank heavens. So you, you've got you've got some impetus there to uh, you know, but here's the here's the really important thing to understand that most people don't understand. They think, well, okay, you've got to start down, you've got to write a book, you're going to publish it in a year, so you got to get it done. No, the trick is to start two years ahead of time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm working on the book now that we'll publish in 2018, and I'm almost done with it. So I'm ahead of the curve. Then I get some you know downtime, and I get a chance to take a breath and so forth. Because I won't have to have that turned in until after, you know, that book publishes. Right. So that's the trick: is get ahead and stay ahead. And it's not that hard to do. You can I can write a book in about eight months, eight to ten months, and do a good job on it, and not you know feel like I'm rushing it or I'm cutting yeah. corners or whatever. Have you ever thought about the uh, you know the the words and the stories that that don't get published? I mean, like if you were to think about it, like what. What percentage of what you write is either eventually scrapped because it's going nowhere or you thought it was a good idea at the beginning or it just gets reworked beyond recognition so it might as well be something brand new? Well, I don't work like, I don't work like that. Um, I, I do uh, an outline before I start. Mm -hmm. of the, I always know the beginning. I always know the end. And I know most of the characters. I know the main characters before I start out. Then, you know, I'll rat around with getting started, I might do 10 chapters and I'll start writing. And the writing tells you where things need to go anyway, so you'll move things around and you'll change things and um, it, it'll kind of start to tell you as you go where it needs to go next. And uh, so you, you work that way. Uh, but my process is to write something one day, read it at the beginning of the second day and make all the editorial changes I want to make and then start again and do the same thing. So I work in increments. But when I'm done, I go, one, it's pretty well done. I will go back and my wife and I will both read it and mark it up and change it in any way we need because she's my first reader. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll turn it in. I'm done. And so I don't even think about what I've lost along the way because it's gone. Yeah. You know, it's gone with the wind. Uh, so for me, this is, this is a, it, it's a way that keeps me moving ahead all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things you need to do. You can agonize, you know, you can agonize forever. I just finished a story where I agonized over the whether it would be first person or third person, mm -hmm. present tense or past tense. It was 
unbelievably <laughs> awful. And I will never do that again. That's like second guessing yourself. Yeah. And it, it took it took forever to finish the damn thing, and I'm still not sure it's ready. <laughs> so just make a decision and run with it, right? Yeah, I think I'm going to have to cut loose, you know, and say that's enough. Just go <laughs> there and do your job. <laughs> So, like, you know, everybody who writes or creates in any way, shape, or form, and I'm not going to ask you that age-old question of do you get writer's block. Everybody has days where it's just not flowing. Um, I have those at my day job, and it's a very cut and dried, financially oriented. <laughs> there are days where I can't look at another spreadsheet or I'm just going to go nuts. So I, I know you'll have those moments. Do you have something or someone or or what do you turn to for that inspiration to keep you on that cycle with the keep moving forward mentality? Well, I just turn around. I've been looking out your yeah. window. I didn't want to say anything because you're awful See nice that? to look at. But what wow. that is? <laughs> Those are my bills. <laughs> I get immediate inspiration when I see them. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the window because your view is no. gorgeous. No, well, I, I do get, uh, this is a beautiful place and I'm lucky to be able to work here because I can see the ocean right over there and the woods in back of me and obviously it's very evocative for a writer to have that, but I've written looking at cornfields, walls, uh, you know, in little bitty spaces, in bigger spaces, I've done it all. And, you know, it doesn't really make any difference. What matters is what's happening up here, you know, what's happening with you. Uh, and if your mind is working the way it's supposed to, then you're okay. Uh, so that's kind of kind of what keeps you going. But writer's block, uh, for me, is uh, usually means one of two things. One, the obvious. I've been working too hard. I've been up here too long. Go back downstairs. Meet the kids. The wife would like to see you again. This sort of thing. But stop it. Take a few days. Go on. The other is, I've written myself up a wrong path. Walk away from it again, come back in a few days, and look at what the other alternatives might be. Because if you're having that much trouble, you probably have taken a wrong turn, and you need to find a new path to go. And most of the time, that will solve the problem. <laughs> Not all. Otherwise, bills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when it doesn't solve the problem, you look at your stack of bills. That's right. Yeah, I like that. The stack of bills is always back there waiting because it never seems to go away. It, it's funny how that happens, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, we mentioned the blog, and it's funny you say, I don't want to read other people's blogs. Um, I think sometimes writers' blogs are a fascinating window into their own creative process. You know, sometimes I really don't care about them as people, but <laughs> what they write... Uh, and, that came out really rude. What I mean is, I don't, I don't necessarily need to know the life story of every author of, of every book that I, I read. But I some, don't need to know what they ate for breakfast. Exactly. Um, but sometimes what they choose to write about and how they choose to write about it or how they choose to make a stand on a certain position is very revealing of their creative process. And that's what I find interesting. Um, yes. And a, a couple months ago, in response to national events, you put a post on your blog um, basically calling on fans to be kind and show compassion and, and, and understanding to one another. Um, and in that that essay, that post, you say that you don't usually do this. This isn't You don't usually put yourself out there. You don't usually you know air personal feelings. Um, so question one is, was that the first time that you had really done that sort of thing? And, and as a follow-up to that, what kind of feedback had you got, have you gotten from fans related to that? Uh, I've done it before. Yeah. Uh, uh, sporadically. Um, I, I don't feel like... Uh, and, and I think I was being a little cavalier earlier, no doubt. Uh, <laughs> but I don't, I don't feel that it's totally wrong for, for writers to blog. And I think when they write, talk about to go out and, and speak in public or write about online about their creative process um, or even who influences them, things of that sort, business related things about their lives. I think that's all right. Um, but I don't, I'm, I'm more about not letting people get too much into my personal life. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, for God's sake, uh, both uh, the guy, uh, Sean, who runs my website, and my wife are better known on social media than I am. <laughs> you know, Judine car carries on a regular conversation with Jeff Vanderveer. I've never met him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, and it goes on from there. So uh, it's, uh, it's just it's some of my personality to uh, not, not to want to do that and to 
feel like it's not particularly a particularly good use of my time. Sure. But now and again, like with the, the article you're talking about, I just feel like, oh my God, I can't stand this anymore. I have to write something. Yeah. Uh, or if I feel particularly moved by something, I will write a, a, an article about that sometimes online. I'm just not very consistent about it. And I have to be prodded by either Sean or my wife. Write something already. <laughs> you, you haven't written anything for days for the for the readers. To, you know, write something about something. What book have you read lately? You love that sort of thing. So I will I will put something up uh, on those lines, and I put up quite a bit during the filming of uh, Shannara Chronicles because there was some kickback on that, and I wanted to uh, explain why it was the way it was, and also explain uh, to people why movies and TV are here and writing is here and the two don't need to be the same and in fact cannot be the same because of the disciplines involved. Yeah. So, but you know, I have a feeling uh, during the next four years I'm going to be writing a lot more. <laughs> I have a feeling we all will be. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm pretty distressed, so I, I will, I will, I'm sure get in there with both feet. Yeah. Um, you, so you brought it up. So talking about the show, um, <laughs> Wait a minute, can I take it back now? <laughs> uh, no, just a couple, you know, we're not going to go deep into it, but, I mean, how, w when you first saw your world come to life on screen, was it satisfying in, in, in any way, or were you just screaming inside about all the things that they've gotten wrong, and, oh, they could have done this better, oh, this isn't right? I didn't have any of that. Yeah. I didn't have any of that at all. Uh, I really loved it. I particularly liked the opening episode. Um, we had the writers are good guys. I like them. Uh, they have done what they were told to do, which was please stay close to the storyline. They did that. I said, I, I, you know, at the first meeting they said, oh, we're going to follow everything. And I said, not nah, just a minute. Let's be honest here. We know how this is going to work. You're going to want to make some changes. You're going to have to make some changes. You're going to introduce some new characters. You're going to experiment a little bit here and there. I don't care. Go ahead. Just don't mess up the bones of the story and make the characters true to the characters in the book because I got to answer to, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans out there who are going to tear me limb from limb if it's just horrible. <laughs> so they know, and they, they were respectful to it, and they did this. So um, there were some areas where we fought about certain things. Um, because, you know, and it wasn't really them, it was also the studio, you know, the, the network. Um, it was also, I, we have financiers and other producers, and uh, it, it's hell, you know, because it's, it's movie, TV by committee. Right. And, you know, I don't work that way, so I don't <laughs> want anybody else making these choices, but at any rate. So there were some things I wasn't totally happy with, but nothing that was so distressing to me that I felt like, oh, I wish I'd never done this. It's not very good. I don't like it that much. I, these people are too young. They don't fit the mold. Uh, I had readers write in and say, well, there are no black people in your books. Yeah. And I yeah, said, you know. how do you know? Yeah. <laughs> how do you know that? Have you looked carefully at the 26 books? Uh, there's, there's a gay character in one of my books. Nobody's ever noticed. Never. And I thought, well, that's weird. But the, nobody's ever come up and said, this guy, this guy's gay, isn't he? You know, no, I don't know. You know, I've never heard that. So I stick stuff in like that because that's interesting to experiment. And I really felt like this would be a multiracial, multicultural world if it was going to be this world in the future and in the not too distant future because that's how the world is going. Anybody looking around can see it. You know, we have enclaves where it's not that way, but by and large, we're seeing a multi-racial uh, world develop here. So I, I just feel like you know we ought to stay true to how how things are here and not spend all of our time trying to uh, fall back into old habits here. So that was my approach. And when they did it, I said, "Fine, this yeah. next season is going to be even more so." And they said, "How do you feel about that?" I said, "I don't care. Do it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, just get good people." That's what I'm really concerned about. Can these people act? Can they inhabit the character and make it feel like it's the character? I told Poppy Drayton after we, the show was filmed, I'd been on site for, for someone, so we saw each other on and off. And I said, you know, I'll never think of Amberly again without seeing you. Never. Hmm. You were so good at capturing her character. And for me, uh, I don't invest so much in... I didn't come into this, for example thinking, we have to have this kind of person for this role. We have to have this kind of person. I didn't feel that way. I wanted to say, what can you come up with that makes me feel like this is the character? 
And I felt like Manu Bennett was Elanon. He's not seven foot. I've heard a lot about that. And I said, well, you know, we, there's, we can't get any basketball players that want to do this. So, you know, we're going with real actors here. And he's great in that role. So for me, it was okay. I'm happy with it. Yeah. I, I did write some reviews of, of the season for, for the website. And that was actually one of the things that really spoke to me was I was a little surprised at how young it was, and it definitely has that MTV feel to it. But yes, once, it does. <laughs> once I grasped that, and I, I kind of let go of, I was imagining this big epic fantasy series, you know, of a different sort. We won't name any, but I was picturing that, you know. Once I got past that, and I did by the second episode, I'm sitting there blown away by how well the actors were doing this, and I had a moment. It's in one of my my reviews. If you if you ever go looking for it, where I freaked out when I saw Alan on for the first time, mm -hmm. because I had a picture of him in my mind. We I all had that picture of him with the hat and the beard, the older guy, and um, I believe he pronounces it Manu Bennett. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous man. Don't get me wrong. Not what I had in mind for Alan on, but he played the role so well that mm -hmm. once I set that aside, I'm like, man, he is killing this role. And he's good in it. Um, so I, I enjoyed that. They they were really good, well, all of the actors. I think that the uh, MTV people, well, everybody uh, involved in the show, made a conscious effort to stay away from The Lord of the Rings. They didn't want it to look like a rerun, a retread, even though we were using their technicians and their filming crews and New Zealand scenery and the whole bit. They said, no, we want to make this a, a clearly different kind of story. And because it's MTV, they wanted a young they wanted a young set of actors for the uh, younger audience that they have. Now, why would I think this is a good idea? Well, I would think it's a good idea because my audience has all grown up hmm. for the years, and now my me you know when I started out they were all under twenty five. Uh, now they're eighty <laughs> and down to twenty five, but not I don't have that teen audience anymore. Mm -hmm. Aha! Uh -huh. Well, I do now. <laughs> you suddenly you do. <laughs> you know, I mean, I always think about this in marketing terms, and I thought, oh, this is great. All right, this is an audience I don't have. Maybe I'll be able to capture some of it. And it certainly has turned out to be true. Those who, younger people who didn't even know who I was, you know, or had never read the books, now are starting to pick the books up and, and read them. And you might as well be relevant if you can be. <laughs> so this, this is a good thing, a TV show. Uh, the, the major thing a TV do, show does for a writer is it's a big, fat advertisement for the books. Yeah. You know. That's such a healthy attitude, too. I don't think a lot... If you don't I, have that attitude, you know, you'll go batshit crazy. Exactly. Because uh, there's too many ways that you can say, I'm wasting my life on this. They've ruined everything. You know? <laughs> I, I don't feel that way. And I set out, I think, with the right mindset about what was going to happen and because I've you know, kicked around with this stuff long enough to know what's possible and what isn't possible. And I talk to young writers now who are getting you know, movie offers, and I'm saying, just remember, it's not going to be like the book. Oh, they said. I said, oh, they'll say anything. They'll say anything. You <laughs> have to understand, it's not going to be just like the book. Yeah. It happens with Harry Potter, maybe, to some extent, um, but everything else, not really. They're two totally different types of storytelling, like you said, and you know yeah. they, they often don't intersect. And it's as long as you understand that and are okay with that, that they're taking the seeds of your story and your characters, and they're gonna maybe remain true to the spirit of those, but yeah. they're kind of gonna do their own thing, you know, because it's a it's a not mm. only is it a different type of storytelling, but it's a to it's a different medium, and people will consume and engage with the story in a completely different way. I had uh, a lot of trouble in the beginning accepting the fact that there weren't more words. You know, <laughs> as a writer, you want, the, you want I wanted more dialogue. I wanted more explanation. And they said, one picture will cover everything you're trying to say here. Yep. You know, and it's true. It, it, the approach you take is so different because the visual answers so many questions that you would otherwise write down as a writer. And I've learned mostly to back off of this sort of thing when I bet the scripts and say, well, you should say more about this. Hmm. Just relax, Terry. <laughs> Et cetera, you'll be all right. Um, well, I know we've, we've already run over the time that we have with you. I have one last question, um, and it's going to be shifting gears a little bit. Um, 
you, so you wrote the Phantom Menace novelization. So you are no stranger to the Star Wars universe. Um, and there's a debate right now among fans, and I have to imagine among the brass at Disney and Lucasfilm, about what to do with the character of Leia after Carrie Fisher's passing. Um, so word rumor, I don't know, you know, the word leaked that Princess Leia, General Leia, was intended to have a significant or expanded role in Episode Nine, obviously, which they haven't even started filming. So fans are now wrestling with the idea of, do we recast Leia, or do we just prematurely write her out of the story that was originally intended? Uh, I'm curious on what your thoughts are. As, as a storyteller, as somebody who knows how to construct and craft a story, and as somebody who's played in that Star Wars sandbox. I have uh, pretty much the same view of this as I have of authors who choose to rewrite books because they think they can do it better the second time. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge, huge mistake and a uh, uh, diminu a dim a dim a I can't say the word, a reduction of the value of their work in their own minds if they're saying they can do it better the second time. It is what it is. She's an original. She's the character. I say we explode a spaceship. That's it. Goes on from there. Something of that sort. Make it a poignant moment. Use it. You know, use it in a way that makes sense for the story. But um, I, I think that, that that ship has sailed. And um, they've got so many other ways they can go with this. Uh, they're, you know, I think this movie that they're doing had better be better than the first one. Because I didn't think the first one was very good. The Force Awakens, so, you mean? The, which one? The Force Awakens, Episode 7? Yeah, it was a rehash of... Yeah. of of the old one. It was the same story. I thought, oh my God, this is terrible. <laughs> I didn't like it. Uh, I liked Rogue One quite a bit. Yeah. I thought that was very good. But in any case, I think they need to, I think they need to focus on making a really good story without worrying about uh, Carrie Fisher's replacement or I think they should just write her out and go on from there. That's, that's what I think anyway. I know they weren't going to call me up and ask me this. <laughs> <laughs> we did though. We called you up and asked you, so it it's is. important to us. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, you know, working with George, I got, uh, I had a really good time. It was really interesting. And he was very forthcoming about what he wanted to see happen. And he knew. And I keep wondering, I wonder if anybody's talked to him about this. Yeah. Well, I am, I am really curious to know what his original plan for the sequel trilogy was. Because as far as I have heard is that he, after he sold to Disney, he pitched the idea for his idea he pitched his idea of what the sequel trilogy should be and they very politely said uh, thank you uh, we have our own ideas and we're going to move forward with those so I'm just wondering if those that plan will ever see the light of day um, probably not probably not but probably you know not. I think that uh, times move on and uh, it was a great concept he's the one that invented he developed it those uh, those those first three movies were terrific um, and uh, I think, though, that if you don't, it's like with Shanner. If you don't stay in the world and develop it mm -hmm. and expand it as you move along, I think you're better off if you just leave it and don't come back. Because it's too hard after you've been away for any length of time to come back and try and pick up and, and make it continue to be relevant. And I think you see that in sequels. Look how many books have been written 20 years after the original that was a huge success. You know, who am I thinking? At any rate, uh, and then they come back and write a book 20 years later, and it's like it lays there and begs for mercy. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's hard to do that, so hard to come back and do that. And you're better off to just say, okay, that was a great triumph, move on, do something yeah. else. Exactly. Terry, thank you so much. This is, it's just been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, we could easily sit here and do this again for another 45 minutes. So I, I, I appreciate your time. Maybe next year. <laughs> Absolutely. When the, when the next, when the next trilogy comes out, we can, we can have a retrospective looking back on everything. There you go. All right. Well, it's very nice talking with both of you and thank you for taking the time to come visit. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for this week on the great big, beautiful podcast. Now, something you were saying earlier, Sam, that, that I resonated with was, you said your dad called the books the devil books. <laughs> <laughs> and and I remember when I was a teenager, not even, it was a young teenager, like 13, and I first came in contact with the Lord of the Rings series, my first time finding on the shelves, 
and I was so, I came from a religious house, so I was very scared bringing that book home because I didn't I didn't know anything about it, and I thought maybe my parents would freak out because it was like fantasy and it could just that's the way the world worked. And but they were fine. But I remember I remember being so afraid of my mom finding that book in my book bag. <laughs> <laughs> that book's got magic in it. Yeah, that book has <laughs> wizards and yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. No, but they were they were but they were like no. Have you have you ever heard of C.S. Lewis? tried to push the narnia on me but <laughs> but yeah that, that really yeah, good that. parents they got to push the narnia right oh, of course yeah 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 <laughs> well and then you play that well you know tolkien was uh, went to church too you know <laughs> <laughs> anyways enough about my crazy religious past my parents <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yeah, that was a great interview. You guys had fun? You sounded like you had fun. <laughs> I think I mostly kept the internal screaming and excitement in check. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not normally, as you guys have probably already picked right. up, I'm not normally very energetic and bouncy kind of person. Mm-hmm. So, like, and I was a bit during that. I that. could hear myself doing it. And I'm like, well, oh, it's good to be excited. But it was weird <laughs> for me. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've, you know, I've met and talked to some quote unquote celebrities before mm-hmm. in my day. Um, and wouldn't you know, I, I'm i fine. Like, right. it's cool to meet people. They do interesting things. And then I'm talking to an author, which most people don't consider those the rock stars of celebrities. Right. right. And that's the one that I freak out at inside. I swear to God, I kept having to push myself back from the table. Cause I, my, my legs were, were bouncing up and down. <laughs> and I was just trying to stay still the whole time. Yeah, I totally had a fangirl moment. It was the first of my life, you know, <laughs> waited till I was 40 to freak out. But right. you know, I Good got there you. eventually. I'm glad, I'm glad we could have facilitated that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad too. Thank you. Well, Justin, funny. what was your fangirl moment in this show? Um, I think, I think, a lot of them. I think LeVar Burton saying, hello, Jamie Green. I think that yeah. was like because his voice is instantly recognizable. And to hear yeah. that we, he was on the phone with us. And another, I think the biggest one, though, was when we were sitting on Skype and Neil deGrasse Tyson called in. And we were, you know, we knew we were interviewing him. But then he just goes, well, I'm going to turn my camera on. And then he was there <laughs> in our, on my screen talking to me on video. That was pretty, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have to agree with you. That was that was a that was a moment. I was jealous of that one. I have to say, when Jamie shared that you guys were entering or were interviewing him, mm-hmm. I was sitting there going, "Man, they have such a fun life." <laughs> I do have to say, Sam, it was the it was when we talked to Clark Gregg, right? You didn't yes. let me hear the end of it because she was desperately, desperately yes. begging to be in on that episode. Yeah. Oh so, man, yes. Been He's just so cool. And, you know, he does good work. Don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. And and then, like, it was actually from your guys talking to him and, and discussing it on your podcast. Right. I did a little more research that I found out some of the other cool things he'd done that I didn't even know, like behind the camera stuff, mm-hmm. um, which was cool. And then, obviously, he, he's married to Jennifer Grey, for crying out loud. I mean, they're just, like, royalty <laughs> now to me. And, yeah, so I... Learning about that, I was freaking out. I don't know, Jamie, I must have tried to feed you like 50 oddball questions. I'm trying to, because I was trying to ask weird things. Yes. Like, not the normal, you know, right. which is good to know. Like, where's this show going? Where, where's your character mm-hmm. going in your show? I want to know those things too, but everybody's going to ask those. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I I was disappointed you didn't get time to ask him about the, the outfit from the, um, from the lip sync battle. Uh-huh. I didn't. I know I asked him about the lip sync battle. I thought I didn't hear it in the podcast. Oh, I'm pretty sure we did. We'll I don't know. I have to go back and listen. We'll have to go back digging through the archives and see. Maybe, uh, maybe I just well, you know, I do get interrupted a lot, child. Yeah. Oh, that happens. <laughs> that happens. It. I want to say one thing before we cut out. Um, yep. Something you mentioned, completely off topic, because you mentioned Jennifer Grey. So um, I went last night to watch Singing in the Rain on the big screen because it's the 65th mm-hmm. anniversary. Now, 65 years is a long time, but with a movie like Singing in the Rain, you're like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, 65 years, that sounds about right. In the introduction, you know, they had the AMC, or it's not, it's TMC, I think now. So the TMC um, the guy talking about the history of the movie, blah, 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 and what other movies are coming up. So that didn't make me feel old because I'm not 65, right? So... <laughs> 
this year is also the 30th anniversary of Dirty Dancing. Now that makes me feel <laughs> old. 30 years old, Dirty Dancing. That's just, it should not, that, that that's not right. So I think somebody did the math wrong. <laughs> It's funny. That, or you're just old. You know? Or I'm old. Thank it's funny you for how that. pop culture dates us like that. Like I think back on some <laughs> things too, and you know, I don't even want to know what anniversary it is of Jurassic Park. Like that. That's what. That's what I remember yeah. big when I was a kid, and I, that would make me feel old. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to know. No, I don't even want to know. We're not. We're not going to figure it out. I don't want to know. No. <laughs> it was last no. year. Sorry, that was totally uh-huh. off topic. No, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. If you want to find us on. Twitter, you can find us at the GBB podcast and we are on Facebook, facebook.com slash the GBB podcast. Get in touch. Let us know what you're thinking about the show, what you want, who you want to see for guests. And we have some cool ones coming up. I think, I think Jamie has some cool ones coming up. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. There's someone I'm really, inter- I'm really excited about, but I haven't really said who yet. You'll find out. Clickbait. Wait. <laughs> all right. I'm Justin at 140 Justin C Twitter, Instagram, all the fun places. And Samantha. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, Jamie. Oh, you are. Oh. No, Samantha. Go. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm replacing Jamie now. I kind of like this. Uh, Samantha Fisher. You can find me at Geek Mom Blog or um, also on Twitter at Samantha Fisher. Very simple. Awesome. And I'm Jamie at the Robots. The Robots. Roar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. We will see you next week right here on the Great Big Beautiful Podcast. Podcast. Take care. <laughs> Have a good one. This podcast has been a production of the Geek Dad Podcast Network. If you've enjoyed this content, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash geekdad.